Hey, good morning, everyone. It's always a little weird to hear my wife call me Pastor Mike, but I think we might just continue this trend on. She should just say, never mind. <laughs> hey, uh, I just want to just take a moment and say that I don't know that that uh, uh, applaud uh, was worthy of what God did at our church on Easter. Can we just give the Lord thanks one more time? I mean, come on. Come on. Yeah. I mean, just incredible. I mean, Easter was one of those weekends where you go home and you're just like, what a mighty God that we serve, man. What a mighty God. Uh, I'm not that clever. Our staff isn't that talented. No offense, staff. I have none taken. Uh, we serve a mighty God. We serve a Jesus that is alive. And uh, last week we realized that our hope so doesn't have to be a hope so. It can be a no so uh, in regards to the reality of the resurrection. And this week I had a no so, okay? I had a no so. And let me tell you a little bit about my no so this week. Uh, we kicked off our first at least since I've been here, our first annual Sage Hills Church men's softball team. Uh, and I knew, I knew, man, this is going to be a good squad. I mean, I just knew it. I looked at these guys that came out, some of my buddies, some friends of some friends. I looked around at these guys and I was like, I know this. We are going to win. And I wouldn't have signed up if I didn't think we were going to win because I don't like to lose, okay? And I just knew so. I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that we were going to win all of our games this season. It wasn't even going to be close. Uh, we're going to be playing this, uh, this Wednesday night. We play Awaken Church. Uh, yeah, I love Awaken. Yeah, right on. Uh, uh, and, and I'm hoping that uh, Awaken doesn't feel as excited about that guy after we play. But... <laughs> We love you, Awaken Church. But here's the deal. I knew so. I knew we were going to win. And that was until the end of our first game. And uh, um, we, uh, we got mercied in our first game. And, and our second game, not that much better. We still lost. So we are now 0-2. And, um, um, uh, and uh, I quit. So I just wanted to... Uh, <laughs> But here's the deal. Uh, I wanted to take a moment this morning and share with you from God's word of what do you do when your no-so doesn't know, doesn't turn out the way you thought it would turn out, right? Because how many people know that life doesn't always turn out the way you envision it turning out? Anybody ever experienced that? Oh, I'm so glad that you're with me on that. There's just things that happen in life. And, and what we want to recognize is that just because we know that Christ is alive, resurrected from the dead, church, he is risen, Oh, see, you already forgot your line. Let's start over from last week. He's risen. He risen. That's right. He's risen indeed. That's the reality. Just because Christ is risen doesn't mean our lives will be led from an absence of hard times or ambiguity. I don't want to preach a false gospel that takes away all the problems of the world. Uh, what the gospel does is it offers us a place to put our problems, and that's at the feet of Jesus. And so today what I want to talk to you about is what to do when your no-so doesn't turn out the way you thought it was going to turn out. And we're going to do that through God's Word this morning. Uh, we're going to be diving into God's Word in two different places this morning, beginning first with Hebrews chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6, and then you're going to want to put your finger in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. But we'll begin this morning in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19, and I'd ask it out of reverence for God's Word that you'd stand to your feet at this time. This is what the word of God says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. We have this hope as an anchor for our souls. Let me just read that again. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus, someone say Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become our high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. I want to just point out to you uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19, part A, one more time. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you together for today, your word. And Lord, we recognize today that we do have a hope as an anchor for our soul. And it is because our forerunner, Jesus, went to the cross, died on it, went to the grave, was dead there for three days, but today is resurrected and seated at the right hand of God. Oh, what a hope we have in Jesus. 
And so today, Lord Jesus, we come to you recognizing that your word is more powerful than any double-edged sword. We recognize, Lord Jesus, that your word contains all things necessary for life and godliness. And so we turn to your word today and ask you, Holy Spirit of God, to speak to us through your word. Uh, We love you today, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we love you, and we ask for you to speak to us today. And all of God's children said together, Hey, before you're seated, give someone a high five or a side hug or a handshake. Tell them you're glad they're here. I want to remind you today, beloved of God, that we do have a hope and it does anchor our soul. If you look around in our society, what you will recognize is there's a whole group of people that don't have an anchor for their soul. Am I wrong on that? Say, no, I'm not wrong on that. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, The reality is we have people that are tossed to and fro throughout life's waves, throughout life's ups and downs because they are lacking this anchor for the soul. And we know exactly what that looks like and what that feels like to be tossed to and fro because we lack the stability or the firm foundation that is found in the hope that we have in the resurrection. We know what that looks like. We don't have to look very far to see those who are tossed to and fro from life's hard things. We don't have to look very far. You know, Jesus describes this very thing about the person who's a foolish builder who chooses to build their life upon the sand. The thing, what happened was they build their life on the sand, which is not the foundation of the bedrock that Christ has instructed us to build upon. They build their life on the sand, and when the the storms raise up, you know the story, it comes crashing down on the house, and their house is just completely obliterated. Obliterated is a new word, look it up. Obliterated is the actual word. I apologize. It's still Easter wind down in my mind. <laughs> but we recognize what that looks like. But what we, what we don't see very often is an example of what life looks like when we build our house upon the rock. When we build our house that is firm and secure, right? When the author of Hebrews wrote Hebrews 6.19, he says that we have a hope and that hope is firm and secure. Turn to your neighbor and say firm and secure. Our hope is not wayward. Our hope is not fragile. Our hope is not easily removed because our hope is an anchor and that anchor is Jesus. And Jesus is firm and secure. The Bible says that Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The only reason why Christ could be, even for a moment, call himself secure is because he never changes. He doesn't go up. He doesn't go down. He only moves from glory to glory. It's who Christ is, and he's our anchor. And so what do we do, church? What do we do? When life doesn't turn out the way that we expected it. Where are the examples of those who have hope as an anchor for their soul? And I was thinking about that this week and looking through scripture and saying, God, where is the example of someone who had hope as an anchor for their soul? Someone who received bad news and responded to it in a way as if hope was the anchor for their souls. And as I was studying and reading God's word, it was interesting in my, I'm reading through the Bible in a year this year, uh, I was actually in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20 is the story of a man by the name of King Jehoshaphat. Everybody say Jehoshaphat. Okay, I want you to promise me, if any of you have another son, you will name him Jehoshaphat. Please. I saw some people were like, sure, Mike, I'm 70. If I have another son, I'll name him Jehoshaphat. (laughs) There is nothing impossible. Shall we talk about Abraham today, church? No, okay. Uh, but Jehoshaphat uh, is a man of God in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 that literally chronicles what life looks like when it's anchored 
in the hope we have in Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and we're going to be reading about King Jehoshaphat today. And uh, we're going way back. We're going from Hebrews all the way back to 2 Chronicles. And I want you to know something about 2 Chronicles before we dive in. First and 2 Chronicles are the story or what it means to, what it, what it looks like to live in a divided nation. Uh, the book of 2 Chronicles was written uh, to tell the story of what it looked like when uh, Solomon and David had unified Israel and what life looked like after the unification of Israel, after Solomon and David's reign, very shortly after that, Israel, they separated from a northern kingdom to a southern kingdom. And what ultimately happened was the northern kingdom went into exile under Assyria and the southern kingdom went into exile under Babylonia. And I, what I want to share with you is Chronicles talks about what it looks like to be a people who are a restored community. Community. It talks about what it looks like to live in restored community, and it does that by looking at the lives of these kings and the way in which they responded to God's prompting to live restored. So we'll begin today in how we, you and I can learn to anchor our soul in hope, not discouragement. That's our main idea. I'll have you write that down. Anchor your soul in hope, not despair. Anchor your soul in hope, not despair. And we're going to learn how King Jehoshaphat, your next born son, uh, responded to bad news. So beginning in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1, it goes like this. After this, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and some of the Minuites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom on the other side of the Dead Sea, it is all ready to Hezeron and Tamar. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Second Chronicles chapter 20 begins with this idea that things are going decently for Jehoshaphat. He begins to place armies in different places to protect the southern kingdom of Judah. He begins to tear down the shrines of, Asir, of, of Asherah and of Baals. He begins to uh, make sure that nobody is doing false god worship. He begins to reinstill the worship of Yahweh in Judah. Things are going well. Everybody say well. Well, well when things are going well. <laughs> One day, King Jehoshaphat is in his kingdom, and he gets this news from some of the people around him. And they say that an army is coming to attack Judah. And do you ever realize that whenever there's an army coming to attack you, it's never just a, like, the, the news is never in Scripture. Hey, Jehoshaphat, there's an army coming to attack you, but don't worry, they're a group of pansies with no weapons. Isn't it always that when things get tough in life, it's always a vast army? Isn't it interesting how it's never just a small deal, it's always a big deal? Have you ever had that conversation with your wife where you turn to her and you say, why is everything so difficult for us? Anybody ever had that before? Where it's like, it's never just a broken sprinkler. It's the entire irrigation system that needs to be replaced. It's never just a simple fence that fell down. It's a retaining wall and a grumpy neighbor. And, oh, I'm sorry, that's my story this week. But it's never <laughs> something simple. It's always a big deal. Because when the enemy comes at you, he doesn't come at you with pansies and no weapons. He comes against you as a vast army. And that's what Jehoshaphat is realizing in this moment, that there is a vast army that is coming against him. And he's getting bad news in this moment. He's getting bad news. And the way in which he responds to this bad news is incredible to me. It proves to me that he has hope as an anchor for his soul. See, what ho those of us who have hope as an anchor for our soul, we learn how to deal with bad news in great ways. Those who have hope that anchors their soul, they deal with bad news in great ways. Jehoshaphat has the fruit of great response in his life. The fruit of great response because he deals with bad news in great ways. Right? The Bible says in verse 3, and I love it that he says, alarmed. Right? Like, 
Jehoshaphat was alarmed. If you're experiencing some bad news in your life right now, can I just share with you, it is completely acceptable for you to respond to that bad news alarmed. Like, we have this false sense of reality that, like, as Christians, we should never be shocked by bad news. Like, everybody is shocked by bad news, church. Jehoshaphat is alarmed. He's shocked. He probably turns to his wife and says, we're doing everything right, and why is everything going wrong? But he says he's alarmed, but it's what you do with that alarming response that dictates the outcome of the bad news. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 3, alarm, Jehoshaphat resolved. Everybody say resolved. Resolved, resolved to inquire of the Lord. My question for you today, beloved, is when you get bad news, who do you resolve to inquire of? Who do you resolve to inquire of? Do you resolve to inquire people who will feel bad for you as you victimize your bad news? Do you resolve to inquire of second worldly opinions, which is not a bad idea, but the order of the resolving matters? It might be important for those of us who have hope that anchors our soul to resolve, to just build up that resolve inside of us that says, when stuff gets tough, I am going to the Lord. Here's my challenge to you, beloved, and I'm talking to my friends this morning. I am challenging you to develop a resolve inside of your soul to go to the Lord first. Get heaven's perspective first. Because I agree with you, friends might be helpful in the midst of tough times. Doctor seconds opinions might be helpful in the midst of bad news. But what matters most is not the one who only sees today, it's the one who sees tomorrow. And the Bible says because our forerunner Jesus went behind the veil, we have access to the hope of Jesus, to the one who doesn't just know who you are, he knows what tomorrow holds. And so I would just encourage you to resolve to inquire of the Lord. But my question is, as I read this passage of Scripture, and as you study Scripture, the challenge to you should be the same, is how does Jehoshaphat have that resolve in his soul? How does he have that, right? Because many of us, when we get bad news, we resolve to depression, anxiety, or drugs, or alcohol, or some other pornographic addiction, or something like that, that will fill us up. How in the world does Jehoshaphat have the resolve in the midst of bad news to say, my first response after I'm alarmed is going to be to inquire of the Lord? How does he have it? I would propose to you today, beloved, that Jehoshaphat, didn't wait till things got tough to start inquiring of the Lord. You see, Jehoshaphat stayed in a life present before the Lord. There's several times in Scripture that describe Jehoshaphat as a man who knew the ways of the Lord. Jehoshaphat lived his life full. Now, I've done this illustration many times. Well, actually only one time for you, but I do it every other week for our staff, so they're bored of it. But I want to do it for you one more time because I think it's so, so powerful for you to understand something, church. What I have before you today is a Sprite can. Obey your thirst, right? Your spiritual thirst. They're, they're trying to speak to you prophetically. They just don't know it. Obey your spiritual thirst, right? And here's what I want to show you. And I have also before you a Pepsi can. Two cans of soda, right? Pretty much the same, same amount of ounces, same, same basic concept. One's clear, one's dark, one tastes good, one doesn't. I won't tell you which one because I don't drink either because I want to be healthy. But if you do, that's okay. So I just want to show you something right here. Just, just regular can, right? Okay, so check this out. Watch this, okay? Yeah. I work out. Jump back in with me to scripture. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so let me, let me just show you this again. Okay, so, okay, another can. Pepsi can, Sprite can. Watch this. <laughs> can I ask you a question? What's different? One can, empty. The other can? Right. Can I just share with you? 
The contents of your can determine your response when pressure is applied. (laughs) That's a good word. (laughs) What's inside of you comes out of you when pressure is applied. And what was inside of Jehoshaphat was he had hope, and that hope anchored his soul. So he responded to bad news in a great way. And so, beloved, I just want to challenge you this week as you go into the Lord, as you continue to walk in his goodness and bad news comes your way like softball losses. (laughs) Just remember, Psalms 112 talks about those who fear the Lord. In Psalms 112, verse 1, it says, Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord. And in the rest of Psalms 112, it begins to dictate what those who fear the Lord, how they live their life. And in verse 7, it says this, Those who fear the Lord, they will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Will you, dissolve, will you develop that resolve to trust the Lord with me, church? Someone say yes. yes. Amen. Let's jump back into 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 5 through 13. So we know so far that a vast, what kind of army is coming? Because the enemy never comes by himself. He always comes with his little minions. And he comes, a vast army is surrounding Jehoshaphat. It says that he resolved to inquire of the Lord. In verse 5, we jump back in and it says... Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah, right? They all gathered together from every town in Judah, and they assembled together and in Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard, and Jehoshaphat said, what he is about to say is remarkably important. He says, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Who can withstand him? Our God. Did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before the people of Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it, have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or the plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name, and we will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But now, here we are. Here are the men from Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming out to drive us out of the the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do But our eyes are on you. All the men of Judah with their wives and children with the little ones stood there before the Lord. What? Man, what a powerful prayer. Wouldn't you just love to be part of a country or a nation that when things got tough in life, they're going to give their giant speech. And rather than filling that space with voidless words, they sought the face of the Lord. Oh, God, that you would send us our great country. Lord, uh, uh, Lord, a leader that would seek your face. Oh, man, to be led by Jehoshaphat who sought the face of the Lord in the presence of a vast enemy. He sought the Lord. And what he did in that time was he proved the power. He proved the fruit of unwavered faith. He showed what it looks like to have hope as an anchor for your soul through unwavered faith. And I wanted you to know something today. Those who have hope as an anchor for their soul, they have a fruit of unwavered faith in their life. And what you see here is with Jehoshaphat is he seeks the Lord. I've been uh, in the church a very long time, Uh, not longer than all of you, but Longer than some of you, I'm sure. And I've been in church a while, and I've been around a lot of people who are praying people. And I'll share with you, I appreciate praying people. Anybody else appreciate praying people? Yeah, the Lord appreciates praying people. Um, But here's what I've learned about some folks in the church in regards to their prayer. They spend 
a good 30 minutes seeking the Lord, which is great. 30 minutes praying. 28 and a half of those minutes are based around all the things in your life that are wrong. Right? We spend 28 and a half of the 30 minutes we have to pray telling Jesus what is wrong with our lives. We forget for some reason in our prayer times that God is sovereign. Do you think when you go before the Lord and say, oh, Lord, man, my dog is sick, my wife is leaving, my kids are a mess. God, my life is basically a country song. And <laughs> another great joke. I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, that's just good. That's just so good. Uh, do you think that God in heaven hears that and goes, son, I had no idea. Are you kidding? Now that I know, I'm going to do something about What? <laughs> Is not the God that we serve sovereign? Is not the God that we serve the one who sees all? Does that mean, beloved, that God doesn't want to know about what's broken in your life? No, that's not what it means. It means that our prayers shouldn't center around the problem. Our prayers should center around the solution. And I would challenge you, beloved of God, into a life of faith that would allow your prayers to not be motivated by difficulty, but by the beauty and splendor of the Lord. Oh, that we would just seek God because he's good. Oh, that we would just pray, have lives of prayers, not based on what we need or what we want, but because the name of the Lord is hallowed. Holy is the name of the Lord, church. And I think that's what King Jehoshaphat does. He introduces the problem, but he does it sandwiched in this idea that, God, this is who you are. And he's doing this to remind God that who God is doesn't change based on the fact that he is surrounded by difficulty. Who God is doesn't change based off the severity of your problems. Did you know that God was fully God as he laid on that cross? He understands the challenge, the struggle, the trial, the tribulation, and what he's challenging you to do in your prayer life is to, in the midst of difficulty, seek him for his goodness, because his goodness is greater than your badness. <laughs> and that's why when Jesus instructs the church to pray, he says, when you pray, Pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There is literally so much in that first opening part of the prayer. It doesn't say, our Father who art in heaven, fix my wife. <laughs> That's not what it says. It doesn't say, our Father who art in heaven, give me a new job. <laughs> Even though that may be the need or the want or desire, it says begin when you pray seeking the holiness of God and not asking the holiness of God to take away the problems. Rather than having the holiness of God take you out of the problem, why not have the holy God meet you in the problem? That's a good word, somebody. I mean, I'm just being honest. I would just ask you today, church, how's your prayer life? How's your prayer life? If you're in a small group, one of the questions you're going to ask, answer this week is, rate your prayer life on a 1 to 10. And whatever your score is, how do you make it better? Because I've never heard anyone who's gone through a hard time say, man, I prayed way too much. <laughs> I want to encourage you to continue to seek the Lord. And you know why it's difficult to pray when things get tough? At least this is just for me. Because I grew up in a culture... Right? I grew up, I was a 90s kid, you know? I grew up watching, remember the show Tool Time? Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Right? There's so many people who are like, what is he doing? It's okay, millennials. TV used to be good. Okay, so. <laughs> um, and right, we had this idea that like, it was the manly response, right? Is to get your power tools and get your muscle on and get strong. And if we're honest, prayer Seems a little soft. <laughs> like if we were just being really honest, if there's a vast army surrounding the nation of Wenatchee, we would hope that our, our, our city government officials might muster up a battle. 
They might muster up some guns and some defense. They might place people on outposts. They might do the things necessary to protect us from evil. And, and if, if we heard that, well, you know, uh, we're surrounded by a, a, a vast enemy um, and we decided we're just going to go ahead and talk to God, we might think that that feels a bit soft, right? Because we've been trained in our mindset to think that prayer is this softball response, right? It's like throwing cotton balls at the enemy. <laughs> Can I share with you, beloved of God, it might be time that we have a change of theology on how we view prayer. And it might be time that we view our prayer life through the lens of Scripture. <laughs> it might be time that we look through God's Word and ask Him, what does prayer actually accomplish? The Apostle Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6, when he says, we, though we live in the world, we don't wage war the way the enemy does. <laughs> the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, nor of this world, but they are mighty through our God. They are mighty to demolish the strongholds of the enemy. Does that sound like a cotton ball to you, church? It sounds like the weapons that God has equipped us and Jehoshaphat to fight with are a lot stronger than we might think they are. The weapons that we have have the ability not just to tear down enemy fronts, but to demolish strongholds that enemies think they can leave against us. Later on, Paul tells us we take down every false pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. That's the weapons that we fight with. And so, beloved, I want you to know something today. You have power in Jesus. The prayer that Jehoshaphat prayed was not chucking cotton balls at the enemy. He was preparing himself for God to move like only God can do. And the way in which we inquire to God in the midst of our needing him to move matters. And when we believe God to be who he said he is, God shows up. And I want you to know something today, church. God wants to show up for you. And here's what happens. When we do that, when we stand before people in the midst of challenge and we seek the Lord's face, there's something that is beautiful that happens. And it starts in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. We're actually going to jump in in verse 14. It says, this, Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jezel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benahiah, the son of Jael, the son of Matthias, there's a whole bunch of sons, a Levite at the descendant of Asaphah as he stood in the assembly. In verse 15, this is what he said. He said to the king, listen, Je listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you, do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Oh, we could just go home right there. I, I, <laughs> ah, this is so good. <laughs> Right? Because here's what happens, and I, I'll, I won't read the rest of it because we'll run out of time, but here's the deal. Here's what happens. When you have hope as an anchor for your soul, and we're going to learn about this way more next week, hope is contagious. And there's another fruit that comes alongside of those who have hope as an anchor for their soul. It's the fruit of great company. It's the fruit of great company. Listen, hope-centered folks will surround you if you stay in a position of hope in the face of adversity. But here's what we have today, beloved. We have a group of people who are supposed to have hope as an anchor for their soul, but they feel like in the midst of everything that's going on in your life, they feel like it's their role to play the role of devil's advocate for you, right? Like if, this, if King Jehoshaphat's story was written in modern day terms, it might be, then Michael, son of Josie, came before King Jehoshaphat and said, hey, Jehoshaphat, prayer's great, but maybe get ready for war. <laughs> like I'm not saying that praying isn't going to do anything, but I'm just going to play the devil's advocate a little bit here. There's a vast army surrounding you. You might want to get ready for battle. <laughs> and listen, I want you to know something, church. 
We, our role as believers in Jesus Christ is not to play the role of devil's advocate. I don't know where, where or when or why we have taken on the title of devil's advocate. The devil does not need an advocate. <laughs> just think about what you're saying. No, Mike, I'm just playing the devil's advocate. No, you're not. You're being a nincompoop. I want to see your sign, nincompoop. <laughs> I love you, Miss Mug. <laughs> She's awesome. The Mug family is the best. <laughs> I'm just going to keep on going. For us today, beloved, we have got to resolve for one another to play the role of Christ's advocate in each other's life. I want to play the role of Christ's advocate in your life. I want to, listen, when I was a young boy, like 13 years old, I felt like I was called to ministry. My dad was a pastor, and I asked him, this is a serious deal. We were on our way back from Las Vegas. My dad did all kinds of weddings in Vegas, and he used to do something really funny when we go to Vegas. He'd wear his priest collar and go sit at the craps table. <laughs> It was so funny to see people just go, okay, another table. <laughs> we were on our way back, and my dad was discipling me to become a pastor. My dad, literally, from the time I was born until I was 17 years old, my dad was dying. And so he took every opportunity he could to either make me laugh or disciple me. And we were driving home from Las Vegas, and he told me these words, and they stuck with me forever. He said the number one role of a pastor, and I would say, I would take it even a step further, the number one role of a believer in Jesus is to encourage the hell out of one another. Literally, to find out where hell has creeped in and not advocate for the hell, but advocate for heaven invading earth over each other's life. It's the fruit of great company, beloved of God. Hope-centered folks don't play the devil's advocate. They play Christ's advocate. The story goes on and it wraps up and I would just encourage you to read it in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 verses 21 through 29. Jehoshaphat gets this great idea that rather than going to battle against these army, he's going to grab his most fierce, tough men and women, the greatest warriors of all times. He's going to grab the worship leaders. <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest. Pastor Troy's a great guy, super intimidating. <laughs> like, if we were going to war, I might put our security team out front. <laughs> I mean, these guys are big, strong men, you know? Like, but Jehoshaphat decides, let's put our worship leaders in the front and in the back. And I get it. Oh, I get it. Good idea. So they're going to sing a pump-up song to get the army all pumped up. No. They're going to sing a love song. Jehoshaphat, I mean, a love song? Like, what is a love song going to do to prepare us for war? And that's what they do. They go into the battle, and you can read this in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and they sing this song. Give thanks to the Lord. His love endures forever. Amen. Sounds frightening, doesn't it? <laughs> but the Bible says that as they began to sing praises to the Lord, the Lord sent ambushes. When we praise the Lord, when we seek God for his goodness and faithfulness, when we have the fruit of great response, the fruit of unwavered faith, the fruit of great company, the Bible says if we stay in that position of anchored in hope, the Lord sends the ambush. And the Bible says that the Lord destroyed the enemies of Jehoshaphat, so much so that all of the neighboring cities, all of the people that were thinking about coming against this nation of Israel, they began to live in fear of Jerusalem. Because one king decided to have his life anchored in hope, not despair, 
he experienced the fruit of victory. And beloved, if I could just encourage you with this last piece of my message this morning, I would just remind you of this. If I had one last thing to say to you, I would say this. Believers in Jesus Christ don't live life defeated. In the end of it all, we win. We win. We do not serve a defeated Savior. There's victory in Jesus. There's victory in Jesus. There's victory in Jesus. No matter what you're experiencing today, there is victory in Jesus. And for Jehoshaphat and all of Israel that day, they were reminded in a very real and instant way that victory in Jesus is a real thing. And today I want to remind you today, victory in Jesus is a real thing, beloved. Keep your hope anchored in Christ. Receive the fruit of victory.